Um, same as the last one for those of y'all who were in the other ones, I'd like to record this um, so that we can kind of post it for those who weren't able to make it. If you would not like to be edited out of the recording, just shoot me an email and I'll cut you out. Um, but just just let me know. You're also welcome if you want to to turn off your cameras. I'm just going to be presenting my screen most of the time, but you're welcome to do that as well. Um, but really, before we get going, as always, what do y'all want to get out of this? Why are you here? What do you want to learn? How can I modify the instruction to meet your needs? I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, I've, I've used polling before, but I'm sure there's a better way for me to do it. And I, I'm interested in learning how to do better what I've done in the past, I guess. Absolutely. Anybody else have any thoughts? Why, what, what do you uh, want to get out of this? I sort of get no idea, but I thought... Um, uh, I was trying to keep the attendance, but uh, I usually just have a problem uh, keep the attendance. I have you know forgot to do that, but now I think I think this could do much more than attendance. But I want such technology. Uh, I was thinking, see, there was always some overhead when you when you use it online. I tried to say, well, if I put everything on Blackboard, I hope to have a link, say. Uh, you don't come to a class, but you have to go there. Just try to say, have you read, watched the video, or something like that. You know, in one place, just one click, they will say, well, I did, or I did. So something like polling, and or like, at least I keep the attendance. Don't want them to just be just at home, sort of, don't do anything. I got you. So I'll see if I can. Um... I think you probably mean something else, maybe a teaching tool or something. That is the plan, but I'm also happy, provided we have some time at the end, to talk about ways to manage attendance online and things like that. I have no problem with that at yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs> so, so my interest is is sparked by, um, this is probably over a decade ago. It is over a decade ago. I studied abroad in Australia at the University of Melbourne. I took this giant lecture, and the... Uh, instructor was able, there are all these clickers everybody had in the room, the instructor was able to pull people during lectures but with certain questions, and it would show you the percentage you got the question right, etc. And it seemed really helpful in terms of not just during the lecture, sort of giving people real time how much people were, were uh, learning, but also the professor seemed really able to use that information to sort of tailor instructional styles for later lectures. And I'm kind of hoping that this is about how to do that should we end up doing a lot of online lecturing. Because I see, I've seen that work in a classroom with the technology. I've tried to do it online before and I've failed miserably, so. <laughs> That's how we learn. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Yeah, um, during the, the summer, uh, I attended the, uh, a online class is called uh, online classroom management. Uh, so the it's uh, it's about one month. I have already completed. Uh, there are many um, instructors uh, give the uh, lectures, and uh, after they finish, uh, always uh, there is uh, a poll and ask you uh, like. A, feedback opinion. So I think uh, it's good because I want to know my students' opinion. Excellent. Excellent. You all pointed out different ways to use polling and, and how, I mean, different types and things like that. So yeah, I think this is wonderful. Let's go ahead and dive in. Oops. Turn and look present now. And share. Let's see if this works. All right. Can y'all see the polling, Pete? thing the screen yeah all right cool deal so our agenda for today are basically we're going to start off kind of identifying polling i'm y'all already seem to have a, a grasp on it so we're going to breeze through that but then we're going to talk about some benefits and some best practices as well as some specific tools and i'm guessing that we're going to have time to for me to kind of demo some of these tools to you so you can see um, what each one looks like and the kind of the benefits and the drawbacks of each one um, if you would, by the way, if everybody would just mute your microphone so that we don't get feedback or anything like that, and if you would like to obviously say anything, unmute yourself, but um, that way we don't have that. So first off, what is polling? Basically, it's using some form of, form of audience response in order to get real-time data from your students. Nathan also already pointed out that this is the, one of the main benefits is that it is real-time. 
Um, as he mentioned, there's there's kind of the the older school. It's not old school, but it's older school method of using little clickers that you hand out. Um, I actually had some of those when I was teaching in Dillon, South Carolina. I was teaching 11th grade English at the time. And um, we had some clickers that I used because the most because technology in Dillon, South Carolina is still not where you would like for it to be. Um, it has come a long ways, though. I'm very proud of what they've done. But um, at that time, we, I used clickers to get to, to do a lot of student polling and things like that, just like he had in the University of Melbourne. Um, usually polling involves a digital tool nowadays to make it easier to respond and also to aggregate the data, but not always. But nowadays it usually does, and especially if you're doing it online, it obviously always will. And oftentimes it's used to check for understanding, such as formative assessments, to see, okay, now that I've taught this subject, let's get a quick kind of look at the room, get a, get a feel for the room, take their temperature, if you will, and see how, if everyone has kind of gotten where I want them to go or not. And that way I can use that to either reteach or modify my instruction to meet their needs. Also, you can use it a lot of times to generate discussion, especially if you ask open-ended questions and use polling software that allows students to type in their own answers instead of picking from a list that you generate. Or if you ask the questions that, have, that are kind of controversial, and then you have the obvious answer choices that you know that some students are going to come down on either side. You can use those to kind of generate discussion and say, okay, this is where we are, and then let's talk about it, and now where are we at the end kind of thing. So I've already kind of hinted at some of these. It allows extremely quick formative data so that you can get a real-time understanding of student understanding. Wow, I'm redundant there. But um, it allows your formative data to be gathered very, 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 very quickly. It is, that is one of the major benefits because there's so much power in being able to reteach something immediately or instantly start talking about something that students don't understand instead of waiting until you grade their homework next class or the next week and then getting back to it. Because by then, a lot of them have moved on and they don't completely understand or remember what you're talking about. Um, oftentimes it's useful as a pre-teaching tool, that way you can kind of get un get understandings of where they are before you start teaching things, before introducing a new topic or before going over stuff again, you can say, okay, what do you know about the Pythagorean Theorem before actually diving into it? I also like it because it enhances engagement by adding some interactivity. Um, by pulling students into the lecture, they're no longer, it, it makes them active participants, they're no longer passive passively listening to you talking or watching you on the video or whatever. They are now active contributors to that, and it also gives them voice, especially if you're doing the kind of um, discussion-based questions. It allows them to voice their opinion and their thoughts so that in a way that is accessible to all students, because a lot of times students will be kind of shy, and they'll shy away from voicing their opinions, but if you do it using a, a poll, especially if it's anonymized, they can get their opinions out there without having to face their public speaking fear that a lot of students have. Um, as for best practices when it comes to polling, the first rule of online polling is you don't grade them. The first rule of polling in general is you don't grade them. The second rule of polling is you don't grade them. These are formative assessments. They are not summative assessments. You never want to grade your polling. Your polling should only be, and always and forever be, to get some formative data on your students. You don't ever want to grade them because if you start to grade them, even once, even if you just grade one, that will always hang there for your students. And they will always be thinking, is this graded? And that will put that that will put some anxiety on them. That will put that will change their mindset from I am going to be open and honest and tell you how I feel to what's the answer you're looking for. So make sure that whenever you're doing polls, never, ever, ever grade them and tell them from day one. The first one you do, I will never be grading these. These are simply to help me help you. Whenever possible, use the same tool. And one of the next slides, I'm going to show you a bunch of different possible tools you could use, but you want to use the same one. The reason for that is because every time you use a different tool, that requires the students to kind of learn that tool, and it places more cognitive load on them. So now if they're used to using Poll Everywhere, and then you suddenly jump to Answer Garden or you jump to a Google form or something like that, now they're having to stop and say, okay, I'm no longer thinking about the question you asked. I'm thinking about the interface and how I can interact with the interface so you, it, it just adds that extra cognitive load onto them. Um, try and use quick questions whenever possible, not application questions. Like you wouldn't want them to um, solve a derivative or to, um, I, I don't know other content, you wouldn't want them to, to analyze a poem using a poll. 
because it want, you want it to be something quick and simple. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there for 10 minutes waiting for people to solve it. And that's, that gets very awkward very quickly. So you want to use kind of quick questions to get a quick gauge on them. You'll see I'm using the word quick a lot because it's a theme that runs throughout polling. Combine both check for understanding and self-reporting questions. So, for example, you could ask them a, a, like a quiz-style question. Where are the Great Plains? Where they have to know or don't know the answer. But also ask them questions like, how do you feel? How what? How do you feel about your understanding of this concept? Do you got it? Do you not got it? Do you need some help? Are you almost there? So combine both those types, keeping in mind that self-reporting questions will skew higher because students think they know more than they actually know. But it also lets you kind of gauge their understanding and their feelings towards their own learning. And give some wait time. But like when you ask the question or, or start the poll, say, okay. I'm going to put the poll up there. You've got 30 seconds to look at it before we really start answering. Ready, set, go. And then however long, obviously adjust the time based on whatever the question is, but give them some time and say, we're just going to think about it so that they don't just jump in immediately and start pushing buttons and doing stuff. You'll get much better responses and more accurate responses if you build in a little bit of wait time. So before we actually go into the tools, any questions thus far about any of this? All right. Well, uh, oh, sorry. Um, I'm trying to eat some string cheese here. So You're good. I just finished my chicken and rice. So it took me a second to swallow. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I understand not grading their online poll responses. Can you or have you graded whether or not they participate in the poll? I have not because I, generally speaking, anonymize my polls. I... I can't really see a reason not to do that. I just shy away from assigning grades to them because I want them to see them as form as purely formative assessments, as things that they are not required to participate. I, I don't know. That's an excellent no, that question that I've never really considered. No, that makes sense. I'm um, I'm considering using them in a CFU perspective, so to kind of check for understanding. Uh huh. And um, I was wondering if. If that was something, you know, if knowing who they are was helpful, but 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 I totally hear what you're saying, and I and I agree that, um, you know, grading them will probably change their responses if one were to grade them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't have the, the an excellent response to that. I, I've never really considered grade, grading participation for them. Um, you can try it, see if it works, see what it does. Um, I can see it either way. And as far as check for understanding goes, yes, it would be beneficial to to um, know exactly which students learned, like got it, and which ones didn't. Mm -hmm. If it were me, I might because right. I'm tr I, I contrast polling with formative assessments in that polls are extremely quick, while formative assessments yeah. are quicker than summative assessments, but they also take a little bit longer. And in in my brain, this is not right. this is not me speaking ex cathedra. This is just Josh Bastine. In my brain, polls are something that all I'm trying to do is gauge the room instead of mm -hmm. actually formatively assessing each student. Um, but again, that's just me. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. As I, as I don't answer sense. your question, basically. Um, so... No, I think you did, though. I think, um, um, I think it makes sense, and, you know, I think there's a lot of good things to what you're saying. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Um, there's a lot of different polls. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, this is just my favorite ones. Um, and I'll just kind of go through. I made all these links so I can demo each one for you and kind of show you what they're like. Let's see if it lets me hit escape and get off there. There we go. Poll Everywhere is probably the most popular um, polling thing. We talked about this in one of the previous, I think, the formative assessment ones. Poll Everywhere allows you to do polls that students can answer either with devices or by texting. I think it's my personal one. I have the Poll Everywhere account set up on. Yes. So let me create... Create a new poll, and then you can have multiple different types of questions here. And you set these up beforehand. You can have multiple choice where you type in, where are the Great Plains? And you just add your answers um, at the Great Airports in the Midwest. You can add additional options if you want to. Nowhere. And if you also want, you can add pictures as your as your options. So if, if you are doing any type of visual things, you can add pictures. 
I oftentimes will use this as kind of a how do you feel or how do you feel about this or how did I do and I add emoji pictures or like reaction images that show crazy faces that are either like super happy or super sad or whatever. Um, that's useful. And then let, I can add another activity. So now I've got um, the, the Great Plains done. So now we might add a word cloud. What's the best animal? Add another one where you have the um, up and down participants respond to a question. They can upvote and downvote other answers. So this way you get um, like open-ended open questions, but they also see each other. Um, so tell me how you're doing. Whatever. Now when you're done, once you're done, you just hit create. Oh, they added a new feature. I'll have to look into that later. And now I'm configuring this. So yay, this is what it looks like. So I can look at the next and the previous ones. It looks like it stuck it together with my um, other one. So I've got where are the great plans and all this stuff. Then I can go to test. And then you go to present. So now I'm showing responses and I'm going to activate it. And if y'all want to, you can go to this website or text using your phone one of these things and it will um, ask you these questions basically. It'll, I think it'll stick you with this one until I advance to the next one. So let me open up a private window just to kind of demonstrate. I think that's the shortcut. There we go. Polev.com slash Ashurabaski. PSTEA834. So this is what it, the page you're trying to reach isn't there. Did I spell my name wrong? I sure did. DASTEA834. There we go. You put your name in. Josh, I agree to your cookies. I don't want notifications. Now I've got these things and I can click. Uh, let's see, has anybody responded? No. So I can click at the great airports because that answer makes me smile. And now I can see that we have 100% because I'm the only one who has answered at the great airports. In my other window, um, I'm not allowed to change it unless I click clear last response and then I can come back and pick in the Midwest. And now it shows up down there. Put that to the side, Put that over there. And I can make that full screen if you want to. So if you're doing it on, uh, if you're presenting your screen to your students and you want them to see the whole thing, you can make it full screen if you so desire, like that. And then now that I'm done with this question, I might just go to the next question. What's the best animal? And I want to activate it. And once it's activated, it'll show up for the students. What's the best animal? I'm going to say it's a dog. If somebody else responds, and they say dog, it'll make dog bigger. If they say cat, it'll add cat up there, and then I'll have to smack them because dogs are better than cats. If they add another animal, it'll show up there like this, but as more people answer the same thing, it makes it larger. And then the next one was the um, tell me how you're doing. So I can activate, and if I enter a response, I'm doing awesome and submit, it now shows up in the bottom and I can upvote or downvote it. I can also... Yes, Peter? So I tried texting that number and I don't know if it came through or not. Um... Previous... That one right there? Oh, uh, yes. You texted this message to that number and did it answer you? Uh, no, I didn't receive any answer. That makes me sad. They're normally pretty quick. Okay. Well, let me try again and be sure I did it right, because it may, it may be operator error. 37607. Yep. And now you got me curious. I'm going to try it, too. Okay. Best thing in PD is large blocks of silence. For what it's worth, I was able to log in through the website really easily. Okay. Excellent. But I see Komodo Dragon. Was yes. that was that you, Nathan? Good that, choice. That, that was my singular contribution, yes. Good choice. 
Yeah, I'm not able to get the text. Um, I got it instantly, Peter. Like, it's oh, that's okay. weird. I'm probably doing something wrong, man. If you're um, texting that all one word, it does not have the N on Bastine? That's right. Hmm, I wonder if it's a connection delay? Huh. Thank you for highlighting that SMS is your backup, not your main thing, because obviously there can be delays or problems that if students have devices, it's probably better for them to do it through the website because yeah. as I mean, because the website's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically how that works. Um, so once you're done, you can you can just um, you can export your answers if you so desire, which uh, I like the response history. And that's for that single question, that individual question. So I can go back to the previous one and export this one. And now I see the Komodo dragon and dog. It tells you whether they responded via your the online or text. It tells you their screen name. So if you want to, um, wanted to do any type of participation, this way you, you now have their screen name in that export. And that's the basics of Poll Everywhere. They have other um, question types. They have other things to explore. But that's kind of the... Oh, I see cats. Oh, I'm going to get whoever that is. Yep, that was me. That was uh, you. Uh, I, 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 was just, I was just seeing if it worked. So, <laughs> so I am actually a dog person. I just wanted to... Yeah. I'm wondering now. Let me. Act, is this one still active? What's the best animal? Can I add dog again? Will it make... Will it? Yep, see, it makes it bigger. Yep. And if I add Komodo, it makes that one larger. So you can see as the more times things are... Are added, it makes this cool little word cloud so you can see the, the main things that people responded with. That is really cool too, in terms of like a visual communication, like, uh, you know, visualizing uh, prominence or visualizing uh, popularity. Absolutely. A really, really good thing. Thank you. Um, so that's Poll Everywhere. It's kind of the, the kitchen sink version where it has a ton of different things, um, different question types and whatnot. The next one is Answer Garden, and it does one thing and does it very well. It does those word clouds that we just talked about. It's super simple. You just hit Create Answer Garden. You type in your topic. Um, we'll just do animal. What's the best animal again? And you have options. I always just do classroom because moderator, you have to like approve each one. Obviously, that has its uses if needed. Um, brainstorm, I've never used. They've added that since I used this last. So I'm not sure what that does. We can explore that later. You can limit the answer length to either 20 or 40. If you want a password, you can do this. This way, in case you're if you're posting your stuff online, you can make sure um, that people who are not supposed to be there aren't going to be there. You can turn on a spam filter. Um, I've never had to, but know that it's there. You can automatically lowercase or uppercase things. But I always just generally leave these as blank. I mean, as default, rather. And then just hit Create. And then you just have it right here. And all y'all have to do is I would share this with you. I would copy and then paste it into Blackboard. Or in this case, I'll just paste it into the chat. That way you don't have to actually type it in. But you could type it in if you wanted to. I'll do a tiger as the best animal. And it adds it there. And as y'all add the, as y'all, um, other people respond, or I can type in another one, dog, it will update and add them on here. One thing to note is that you have to click this refresh button if you're not adding things in order to refresh the page. Otherwise, it won't show up. Still the Komodo. Um, so now you've got, you can see how they're added. So if I come up here and type still the Komodo, makes it larger just like last time. However, if I type Komodo, it's treated as a separate entity. It does not tack it onto the other one. Still cats. Dog, tiger, still the Komodo. So that's that's pretty much all that Answer Garden does, but it makes it easier than Poll Everywhere to do these type of things. It's easier and it's faster. So if you're wanting to do that, I would recommend Answer Garden. If you're wanting to have the more options, do Poll Everywhere. Google Slides has a cool Q and A. This is this is kind of like inverted polling or a polling where you simply ask them a question out loud and then um, have them answer where I can go to presenter view in Google Slides and you can see I've got now have two little windows I have the main window which I would put on my projector or I would share with my students and I would take this one and I would drag it off to one of my other monitors I'm gonna leave it here so you can see it but I click on audience tools and now I can start a Q&A and I can ask the audience hey 
you can ask questions right there. So if you want to, you can ask questions at that um, website. Or the way I like to use it is I will ask the question and say, hey, how do you think this PD is going? Or how, what's one thing that you want to learn about that, you, that we haven't talked about? Or what's the best animal? Or whatever. Put your answers in there. And I'll just show this and I'll, we'll see all, their quest, all the answers. So if I go to this website, it looks like this. Ask a question. Um, right now, by the way, it's only accepting questions from Coker University. Let me open that to anyone just in case. So I might say, um, what is your name? What is your quest? What is your favorite color? Blue. No, yellow! And now back on um, my little thing here, it shows this. And anytime anybody um, asks a question or adds a response to, on this website, it'll show up here. And I can present that to the class if I want to. If somebody asks a very astute question, I can present and hide that with a quick click of a button. That way I can just show it and kind of guide the discussion to the class that way. So this is different than the other polling options we've done because um, it's kind of reverse or, or flipped polling or whatever. But that's one option I wanted to share. That can go away. Is there is there a way to anonymize the asking of questions on there? There sure is. Let me open that back up. This is anonymous. And they just click yeah, ask yeah. anonymously oh, and submit. And now I it has missed that first time. Yep, so it's it's kinda cool. You can do that anytime. Yeah, And then oops, go back. I'm still in presenter view, so let me get out of there. And then Google Docs and Google Sheets can be used for polls. Sometimes I'll use these um, for things like, I don't know if y'all are familiar with like four corners activities or things like that, but basically you tell you present a statement of opinion to students. This is oftentimes used to, to generate discussion of things like that. Present a statement of opinion. The dog is the best animal. And then historically and traditionally you would have them go stand in different corners of the room if you agree strongly agree disagree strongly disagree then you would have a discussion based on that however you can use google docs and, or google sheets to set this up ahead of time if i wanted to i could come in and make a new google doc and share it with my students ahead of time and just have a little table in there or i'm just going to insert a little table maybe once it gets going with two rows, or two and four columns, strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, so on and so forth. And student, and I just share this with all my students, and they come in and they put their name. Josh strongly agrees that dogs are the best animal. Whatever. You would obviously set this up beforehand and make it a little bit prettier than my ugly mess. But that's one way you could use that um, if you are not comfortable with one of these other methods. This also allows, it, it kind of allows you to kind of keep a running record, if you will, and oftentimes it's funny. You'll have this pulled up and you'll be talking about it. You'll see people go and kind of move themselves around based on the discussion, which makes me, as a former English teacher, extremely happy because it means we're having a good discussion and people's opinions are changing. But that's another thing to consider. You can obviously do the same thing in Google Sheets if you so desire. Google Forms is another one. I like this less than the other options simply because it's a little bit more challenging to get the data in real time. Because um, let's say we make a Google form, and obviously I would have to make this beforehand. And my question might be, um, how did today's lesson go? Something like that. And I, I might do like a Likert scale or a short answer. Let's do a linear scale, one to five. One is bad, five is fantastic. And then I go look at my um, live form, and it looks like this for students. So let's say it went okay, and I submit. I can now look at my responses, and it'll show me exactly how each one did. But this means I have to come in, to, I have to open my form, I have to come in here, I have to click on responses in order to get this. It's a few extra clicks for me as the instructor that I don't, generally speaking, like. However, it also has the very good benefit of building you a nice Google Sheet with all of those responses. So with just a click, you have a spreadsheet of all the responses. 
if you require your students to sign in, their, their username will be there. If you have multiple questions, they'll be tiled across the top with their answers right down below them. You'll see exactly when they submitted it. So it has a lot of data on the back end. It's a few more clicks in the, in the heat of the moment, if you will, of the class. So you just have to decide which one you need to prioritize. And this little responses tab is, is perfect. They didn't used to have this and it was annoying because you couldn't really use this as polling before they went to the new forms. It's been several years now, but um, you used to have to pull up the spreadsheet itself to look at the data and it was not aggregated in any way. But now, if more people answer, it will be aggregated. So if I pick three again, yay, submit another response. If I pick five now, I can look at it, and now it shows that. So Google Forms is another useful tool, especially if you're wanting to pull the data on the back end. I've already talked about Quizzes and Kahoot and, and a couple of the others, so I'll go over them again real quickly. Quizzes and Kahoot are both online quiz platforms. They were designed for formative assessments, but you can use them for um, polling as long as you've set it up beforehand. I like, I, I generally don't, just because kind of like forms, there's a little bit of overhead, but even more so. There's a lot, I mean, because in order for these quizzes to work, it's not a quick go to this website and go thing. Students have to go to the website, they put in their um, their username or, or their password or whatever, not their password, their username, they wait for the quiz to load, they wait for you to start the quiz, you have to, it's it's more overhead. It gets It's better as a formative tool, less useful as a polling tool, but you still can use it if you want, especially if you're going to use it as a formative tool already. That way your students don't have to learn another tool. Do y'all want me to go into more about quizzes or are we are Comfortable with it? Okay, I see some nodding, so we're comfortable with it. Um, Socrative and Nearpod are two more that I wanted to talk about, especially Nearpod. But Socrative is another tool that allows you to do um, polling, but it's more of it's 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 a little bit more holistic type thing. Like you set up a classroom, and in that classroom, you can ask questions, you can do quizzes, you can set up some competitive games with like flashcards and things like that. It's got a lot more to it, but it requires all the students to, to log into the same little room with you. And then this is the kind of thing that you would start at the beginning of your lecture or of, of your class and use several times throughout. So you would start at the beginning and say, hey, how, how are you doing everybody? Everybody in Socrative, now that you're logged in, tell me how you're doing. And you would just pick an emoji. And then a few minutes later, you would say, okay, now that we've talked about our first topic, but here's a couple questions on it. Go into Socrative and answer them, and then, and then you would just do it that way. It's not because it's got a little bit more overhead, just like the whole quizzes thing, um, but it does allow you to have pauses between your questions very easily. And Nearpod, I, I absolutely adore Nearpod. It is a very holistic instructional system, so it's not the type of thing that you would use. If you're going to use any of the rest of this, don't use Nearpod. Nearpod is its own self-contained thing, Basically what it does is, I'm not going to go there because I've got a cool animated website that's distracting. Basically what it does is it allows you to um, upload PowerPoints or create them right there in Nearpod. And it takes those PowerPoints and pushes them to the student devices. So instead of the students looking at a projected screen, they're looking at their device screen, whether they're in class or, wh or whether they're online. And you control as those as the screens advance and everything, just like on a PowerPoint, but you can also embed a lot of things in there, including polls, including formative assessments, including videos and pictures and all kinds of stuff. It's a whole a whole lesson thing. Um, let's see if I still have an account. It's been a long time since I've been able to use it because I they have a free version and they have a um, a paid version. Look, it is going to let me in. Good. So let's look at developing empathy, whatever this is. And I can do a live lesson. And let me get the link to this lesson. Copy, and I'll just post it and paste it in the chat. And y'all can click on that, and it will take you to the live lesson. Or you can go to join.nearpod.com and, and put this code in. Either one works fine. Right now I have zero students, so I'm just going to wait. There's one, and I can click down here and see my students. Nathan's in. Does anybody, does anybody else want to join us, or should should we go on?
Is anybody else trying to join, or should I continue? Just continue. Just continue? continue. Okay. So now that I'm here, this is basically what Nathan's seeing. He's seeing this screen, and as I advance, his screen advances as well. So we're going through, going through, going through. This is just regular stuff, so let's get started. Put yourself in someone else's shoes. This slide contains videos, and I can choose to play this video either on each device individually or this device only. That's if I'm doing it inside of a classroom. But I want all devices. That way it goes for everybody. And it'll play that video for everybody. It's just a YouTube video. We're not, obviously not going to watch it. But it's a YouTube video, and then as I go to the next slide, it'll kick it off. And everybody else um, will stop watching. And now Nathan should see a question that says, what does it mean to put yourself in someone else's shoes? And it has all of your students tiled right here. Anybody who's joined will, will have it their names tiled right here. And once they answer, you'll be able to see whatever they wrote right here. Um, it'll tell me my participation percent and all kinds of stuff. This is built in, and it has all this type of stuff with all kinds of different um, formative assessments. You can add activities on the fly. So if I want to add a draw it, the instructions I can say draw the thing go and just like that Nathan now has a cool little thing on his um, computer where he can draw stuff obviously it's better on the iPad if you if with your Apple pencil but you can still draw things and once he's done his drawing will show up right here I'll be able to see it if you would draw something there we go submitted see he drew a boot he's got a shoe there so I can see exactly what he drew and again, all your students would be tiled right there, and you can see exactly what they did. If I wanted to, I could share this, and what this will do is this shares his drawing with everyone in the class. I can say, Nathan, you did a fantastic job with that. Look at the way he drew those shoelaces. That's perfect. And then I can unshare, and it's no longer share with everyone. And then we're done, so I can close this activity. Yes, I'm done. And go on to the and continue. So it allows you to add those things on the fly, which I really love. Because sometimes you've got those teachable moments that you didn't plan for, but all of a sudden you might be able to do it. So we're just continuing, continuing, and now you can see you can embed different things inside the same little slide. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Students can click through those at their own pace. And there's there's more of the same, same type of thing. I'm not going to take up any more of your time with it, but that's how Nearpod works. That's, that's what it does. So we're going to go ahead and leave this session. You can also do a student-paced one. What this means is exactly what it sounds like. It just gives you a link. You, yes, I know. What? Go away. It just gives you a link that you can send out to students. And then they go through it at their own pace instead of me taking them through it. This could be used for homework, be used for um, asynchronous instruction, to, like prior to coming to class or things like that, especially if you embed assessments into there. You can, that way you can verify they at least completed those assessments based on the content that you presented. And that's that's the gist of Nearpod. They've got a ton of, um, those are mine, but you've got a ton of different libraries. Like you can search ELA, and there's free or paid ones. Um, there's Obviously, it's tailored for um, K-12, as most ed tech tools are, because that's where all the money is. But a lot of times, especially in the high school ones, for our freshmen and sophomores, you can get a lot of use out of those. So that is really all I had planned. Those are the tools and, and all the things I wanted to talk about. What what questions or thoughts or comments or cries of outrage do y'all have? Let me stop presenting. So if you could only use one of the tools that you showed us, which one do you think is best to develop mastery at? That's a difficult question because it depends on what you want to do with it. If I personally could only use one of these tools, I would pick Nearpod every time, hands down because it is such a holistic tool. However, if I only wanted one tool to do just polls with, I would do poll everywhere because it's got it's got so many different polling question types. Um, so does that does that kind of kind of answer? Yeah, it does. I'm just curious because okay. yeah. you're really good at showing a variety of resources and so I was just trying to get a sense of what your favorite one was. I got gotcha. you. Yes, those those two are my favorite. I got a simple question. Uh, yes. So we have so many wonderful tools, but normally you just want to stick to one tool. So you see if I have already made up my mind using the virtual class on Blackboard, 
because I, that I can show my screen, I run other software for the whole, share the whole screen to, to. But then I, all of a sudden I want to make a polling. Uh, but then how can this incorporate in another technology? Any polling, so, you know, I was thinking, here's the link. Let's do, click on the link, let's show a poll. Can these, it looks like every tool they mean to be okay. You are running a class it's just with this. So Cred, near cross, they try to include all the technology. They're all like, okay, and uh, and then let's, uh, are any like pole everywhere? Is that yes. sort of like lightweight? I can sort of during our presenting with uh, another technology like virtual class and they say public. So the student has to have a sign up sign in for poll everywhere and... no they don't have to sign in for poll everywhere that's why that's one of the main reasons i like it and when peter asked what which one i would choose i, I would choose that one because mm -hmm. um now that i've got this poll let's just look at look, what's the best animal i can take this right here this link yeah and just post that I can post that in the chat or I can post it in Blackboard. And any student who, all they have to do is click on that and it will open up a new window so that they can answer. That so way they, they don't. don't... Have, uh, their own registration. Or Correct. Anything. Correct. Yeah. So You're... that that's good. That's what we're looking for. Because I if I stick to one of these things, and uh, also student as well, they, nowadays you, you probably have experience, you have so many passwords to remember. Yes. So, <laughs> so then you have to. I always try to look up the passwords. Now I have sort of like my trick is I have remembered in my head ten password for all these twenty years. No, I would write down my notes. This password number one, password number two. <laughs> like I, so I, I formally remember that I write on the notebook. So you, it's hate to write on the notebook, but then even that I still sort of kind of you know annoying. So remember didn't remember the password. There's so many yeah. things. They all want you to sign up, sign up. Yeah, you do computer science and I do IT, so you, yeah, I, I'm definitely in the same boat where we've got like 20 different passwords I have to remember, and it always takes me three or four times. I yeah. use LastPass a lot of times. Yeah. Um, yeah. I recommend it as a password manager. That way you have a un strong, unique password for everything, but you only really have to remember one. Um, yeah. So if that's something you're interested in, it's pretty cheap. I just have yeah, it personally. I wanted to also, um, to similarly... Uh, plug the importance of uh, like a backup system. Um, uh, something like Spider Rope can be useful. I, I also use yeah. LastPass and just encouraging you to have multiple backups of things. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, so to answer your initial question, I would use Poll Everywhere because nobody has to log in other than you. You just set the polls up ahead of time and then um, all students have to do is click on that link one time yeah, and I they can even leave that open. I'm into this class trying to look for one of these. Method I can you know quickly because I'm not I may not polling every day and not the node I'm running is not really in the polling mass but occasionally I want to make a poll poll and then this is pretty good. Well, good. I'm I'm glad you're finding it useful. What else? Uh, what any of us? Yes, yay. Uh, uh, I I want to ask you a question. Yeah, um, the end of last semester, uh, our club uh, had to. Like uh, uh, using a poll to, to vote president and vice president of our club, and uh, I didn't know how how to do that, and I asked someone else to help me. Uh, I'm not so sure it's Google Docs or Google Form, but it's really cool. Uh, it like we we list the uh, the candidate names and ask them uh, the other club of it, like members to vote then it will give me the the like the, the percentage so who got how like how many votes and it's also the 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 participants like don't need to put uh, put their names yeah uh, like uh, but they do have the names who who participate but but didn't like it's a like, uh, but they vote. Uh, uh, actually, is uh, anonymous. I yeah. guess the That's question is, can the poll become some kind of voting system? Yeah, it's voting, it, it definitely yeah. can. Um, if you're yeah, wanting to access the data easily, 
like a Google Docs and a Google Form and the Google Sheets. I don't know which which Form. one. Google Forms would be the one if you're wanting to do like voting. Okay. And then if you want it to be anonymous, one of the options is to um, mm -hmm. not collect their um, users' email addresses. Why? Well, let me. I'll do that for you real quick if if you like. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. So I am sharing. If I go to, I'll just go to forms.google.com. And that form I just made. Yeah. So let's say this is the voting form okay. for what for your your club or, or whatever um you're wanting. Uh -huh. So you might have um which yeah. candidate. Yeah. And then you might have Jill. Uh -huh. You might have Keisha. You might have Bob. Whoever. Uh -huh. So you've got these different yeah. people. You make it required. Now, right as this is, this would work fine because you're not collecting email responses. However, uh -huh. right now, it's being restricted to users at Coker University, so they will have to sign in with their email address, but they will not collect them. It will not include those in their responses. If you're okay. voting, you also want to limit to one response. Yeah, okay. okay. And that way, when I, if I save this and I send this out, it'll look like this. Which candidate? I'm going to vote for Jill. Submit. it will say your okay. response has been recorded. If I go back, it'll say you can't fill, you can only fill it out once. Uh -huh, yeah. But now mm -hmm. I, as the form owner, can go look at the responses and see, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. there's yeah. my response. That person did the exact the same thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Google Forms would be the way to go for that one. I would make Google Forms. Okay, thank you. Very you are very, very welcome. Yeah. Anybody another else? Question, yeah. Yes. Another question for the, like, the poll every, uh, everywhere. So if you send link to us, we just, uh, us, the students just uh, simply click the link, Correct. then they can find it. They Correct. don't have to, to you, we don't have to give them your username and let them join, right? That's right. You can just send the link. It was designed to be used for large groups, such okay. as like um, conference presentations or things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just a link. And they, it, oh. you put the link at the top, or you just put it in Blackboard, or you send it out in the chat like I did, and just tell <laughs> students, click on this link, and you're good to go. And it, it'll open up a tab for them, and they'll be able to answer without logging in or providing a username or anything. Okay. Nathan, you were going to say something? Yeah, I have a question about, um, so, so the, the Nearpod, the way I'm understanding the Nearpod technology to be working is that you can embed polls and questions and other things into your slideshow. Correct. I'm, wo I'm wondering about, um, so for synchronous use, that makes total sense to me. I'm wondering about if there's a way on there to automate how long into a video or something a question appears or something like that. In Do you Nearpod, know what I mean? Like yeah. In Nearpod, yeah. there's not a way to embed them directly into the videos. You have to do, okay. embed them after or before. If you're wanting to embed them into the actual videos, Edpuzzle would be the way to go. Edpuzzle. Okay, cool. And Coker actually has it, purchased a um, campus license for Edpuzzle. So shoot me an email after this is over with, because I will not remember I'm terrible, and I will shoot you the sign-up instructions. And it's got like a, a join code and things like that so that you can um, get get the full excellent. thing. Yeah, that, that's because actually the question I have for the, about uh, Edpuzzle. So we, I were trying to come online. It looks like they have required to, to pay or something. So... They have a paid version and they have a free version. Um, Coker, has, like I said, has purchased the campus license. So shoot me an email saying that you just need the Edpuzzle sign-up instructions, and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll get it back to you. There's a code that you can put in to upgrade and things like that, and you'll be good to go. Okay. And then also, if you... Go ahead. I, have, I wrote, some, wrote down some notes, although, but you mentioned you're recording this. Uh, so it, because I'm not going to use this immediately. Uh, later, if I thought of something... Are these videos somehow you kept? Uh, so yes, I'm putting them on. I'm I'm gonna I'm putting them on YouTube, and then I'll send out the um, the links to everybody so that you can yeah. review them later if you so and desire. Also, the, for the previous and you know, how to make a video, uh, you know, uh, I will I will find one because uh, I know the idea, but then the, the, there's a lot of details in there I, I can't remember. So the I want to say the video one. That one I think got corrupted. If I remember correctly, there was two of them that didn't save right. One of them I was a dumb dumb and forgot to hit hit, play, hit record. 
and the other one I was demo demonstrating um, something that used my video while I was also doing a Google Meet while I was also recording, and I think it just overrode the over um, overtaxed the video yeah. driver or something yeah. and okay. crashed the whole I think, thing. Yeah, no, I, I, I sort of wrote down some notes, but then. I, and I'm, I like I said, I'm I'm perfectly happy. Shoot me an email, and I will. We can set up a time to do one on one. It can be soon. It can be after the semester insanity starts to slow down. Whatever's best for you. <laughs> yeah, because there are so many of this, but I most of them, of course, you only pick one. Later yeah. on down the road, I say, well, yeah, just talk about that. Then I, you know, <laughs> I was trying to look 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 back to the videos. That's, Absolutely, you know. I'm going to share the ones that I have, and then um, if they're Always, if there's something that you want to learn more about or, or you don't rem quite remember what, what you learned, let me know. I'll be more than happy to come help. All right. Great. All right, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything else I can do for you all? Any questions? I do have one more question. Sure. Which is, um, so like Edpuzzle, for example, sounds awesome. I have heard of it. Is there a... Is there a place that you on, say, the IT or in the IT department have a, a website that's collated all the different softwares that Coker has licenses for or anything like that? Like, yeah. is there a way that I could go and find those things on my own? I don't have, I'm not aware of anywhere that has like the, a, a big list or whatever collated because a lot of times they purchase them for specific people or for specific departments or whatever. Um, okay. And they just send it out via email. Um, hmm. That would be a nice resource to have, though. Now that you mention it, um, I'll add that to my to my growing list of things to do. But um, oh, I'm sure you're really busy. Don't worry. About <laughs> no, it, but, I... but that's that's a good idea, though. It would be it would be nice to have kind of a repository for of categorized tools. That's that's an it excellent would be idea. Really nice. Yeah, I, you would get harassed by less of fewer of my emails too. <laughs> no, so, you know, maybe in the long run it'll save you time. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Anything I can do? All right. Well, uh, thank y'all. Yeah. Uh, yes. One more. <laughs> uh, I for the video, I use one called a Spring Express, Spring Espresso, and uh, it was free, but it's it always keep on sending me uh, things. It's called Spring Spring. Let me talk. Yeah, Spring. Presso. And that one is, well, I got used to it. I used it, but then now uh, it keep on sending me, uh, do you want to upgrade the version? I know you're going to charge it. And then also it has, it has this watermark in this, uh, in this corner. And well, it's pretty nice, uh, but I don't, I don't mind that watermark. Sometimes it doesn't have, so it's just totally good too. But, you know, Doster, you know, he, he told me that he used that one. But now he, I don't know. I look like it will charge you like $20 or something. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I've but, never heard of that one. So, I, I mean, yeah. Doster well, knows I what he's talking about. Because, but. It, it, you know, I was using that and I think, well, I, so you mentioned there's so many different video tools. So I say, well, I just use this Spring Press. So, but then, on the other hand, that may any moment they say, well, your trial version is trial period is over or something and then getting stuck and it keep on saying oh you need to install these uh for the plug-in or something for for working the kodak uh once in a while but on, other than that because i know um i don't have a i didn't pay for this but then i always in that mode it's been like two semester now but i don't make too much video but that works okay. What I'm saying is, it can Coker somehow find one, you know, just one of these type of things. That's what I'm trying to. This may be considered, yeah. Or you mentioned some kind of uh, the, one of those. You mentioned we have at least one subscribe to one, so we, we just don't have to be <laughs> always nervous about. Oh, what about this goes away? And then I was, you know, I get it stuck. I got gotcha. you. Um, yeah. I'm not aware of any like. There's not any that are currently like endorsed by the college or anything or anything like that. Um, yeah. I always recommend if you're going to pay for it, get Camtasia. If you're not going to pay for it, get OBS Studio to record and get yeah. um, OpenShot to edit. I see. 
because those are both free and they're both open source. So you can so you know that there's no um, funny business going on because they're open yeah. source and you can actually read the code if you want to for both of those. Um, but Camtasia is going to be the best user experience because it's mm -hmm. consumer level, while the other two are also consumer level, but because they're open source and they don't charge for them, they're not quite as user friendly in their in in their quality because they don't have they can't yeah. they can't pay people for it. Um, so I, like I said, I've never heard of Spring Spring Presso. You said, um, yeah. So I can't Press, I can't speak for their validity or or, or any anything yeah. like that. But I made some video with it and it pretty good. It works. Okay, uh, that's but, good. Yeah, but I was uh, always nervous about well, this. This will go away any moment. Yeah, and and <laughs> that's one reason again that I like Camtasia. You're not. It's not a subscription base. You pay yeah. for that version of it. So right now I have Camtasia 2020. That's what I'm actually using to record this, and I own it. It's not a subscription based. So I had to pay him yeah. one time, and it's done. John, I want to say John Jewell um, used Camtasia for probably seven or eight years before he had to upgrade to the newest version. So if you get one that you pay for instead of a subscription, it will. You'll, it, I, in my opinion, you'll get better um, stability. Right. So, uh, 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 pull everywhere and the near pod are like a, a free. Pull everywhere. Let's see. Let's let me look at my um, things again real quick. Oh my, where to go? There it is. Looking at my tools, the um, pull everywhere is free. Answer Garden is free. Google Slides, Docs and Sheets are free. Google Forms is free. Quizzes and Kahoot are free. Socrative and Nearpod are what's called freemium. They have free versions with limited functionality. In order to unlock full functionality, you have to pay them for the um, full version. Socrative, um, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think they're, um, let's see, what's their plans? Let's look at their plans. You can have only one public room. And you can only launch one activity at a time, and that's that's fine though. But one public room, so you if you're teaching multiple courses, you would have to use the same room for the same course. Um, if you decide to upgrade, there's Socrative Pro that allows you to get up to 20 rooms, and it's 60 bucks a year. Nearpod is the same where you can have. Um, let's look at their plans. Well, let me sign out. Oh, I'm not presenting my screen, am I? So y'all can't see this. I'm sorry. Um, they don't even have their... There it is, pricing. $120 a year gets you um, up to 50 people, more storage space. Because right, cause the free version, you're limited to 50 megabytes of storage space and only 20 of that per lesson. While the... Um, the gold version gets you up to three gigabytes of storage space. So basically what you're going to end up doing with Nearpod is if you don't pay for it, you run out of room after four or five lessons is the problem. So you either have to delete the old lessons, which you've put work into, and create new ones, or you don't get new ones. <clears throat> um, it is ten bucks a month for Nearpod. Which ends up being obviously one twenty a year, so that 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 adds up. But again, it is a holistic type thing. I have talked to people at Coker about getting a um, site license, and it was just it was far too expensive for the people who were going to use it. So it hasn't been looked at in probably about a year and a half. Does Ed does Ed Puzzle have a lot of the same functionality? Ed Puzzle no. is entirely focused on video. Edpuzzle has, okay. yeah, it's all video. It doesn't have like the the PowerPoint aspect. It doesn't have anything like that. It just basically makes videos, and you can add, you can you can crop the beginning and the end off your videos. You can add voiceovers to your videos and audio notes, and you can embed formative questions like multiple choice, open and um, open answer, things like that into your into the videos at certain intervals. They cool. also added the functionality. Have you, Go ahead. Have you have you shared Edpuzzle through Google Meet before? Like, can you share videos via Edpuzzle also on your screen? You know what I mean? You see what I'm saying? You can, like, can you... but your quality is going to be terrible. Yeah, the, the lag just gets so bad it doesn't work very well. Yeah. So what the way that I'm using Edpuzzle is I'm flipping the classroom where I'm, having, I'm creating instructional videos and then having students view them beforehand via Edpuzzle. 
and then they're coming to class, and I'm just going to have them practice there, because I teach computer science classes. I'm going to have them do the actual activities and, and program inside that class um, while I'm there as a resource. So if they say, hey, what's, what's this variable, what's this constant, or whatever, I'll be able to, to help them out with that. Um, Edpuzzle also has the option to disable skipping ahead on your videos, which is nice. <laughs> And you can see, like, if you set up a class in Edpuzzle, you can see what specific student has watched which video and how much of that video they've watched and if they've rewatched portions of that video, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That's really useful. And they have a Blackboard connection as well, so that if you want to, you can, um, like, create assignments in Blackboard that use Edpuzzle. So that, mm -hmm. that way, once like, it'll actually grade those assessments based on, on the Edpuzzle. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. It's a little finicky with our version of Blackboard, but um, I made a video on how to do that. I'll find that. Um, I'll find that, and I can send it to you later. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.